is so crazy to me. Th this story is like as if you went to a witch and asked the witch to cast a spell <laughs> on the chatbot and 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 it worked. Yes. Like it actually worked. You went to the witch and you got a spell and now the chatbots think differently of you. Now, Kevin, you have a famously tortured history when it comes to talking to chatbots. Sure do. It was just a year ago that you talked to Microsoft's chatbot, Sydney and caused a, frankly, global sensation when it seemed to try to break up your marriage. Yes, and actually you mentioning the name Sydney has sent a, a sort of a trauma reflex down my spine. <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, not just me who's observed this, though, Kevin, because my understanding is that as you have interacted with other chatbots uh, around the world, you find that this situation either keeps coming up or seems to have affected the way that they think about you. Yeah, so this the Sydney story came out, got a bunch of attention, um, and... For like months after that, I would just periodically get tagged in these posts on social media where people would share screenshots of conversations they had had with AI chatbots about me. And, you know, sometimes it would be, you know, basic information. Kevin Roos, he worked at the New York Times, he, you know, hosts this podcast. But other times it would sort of seem to turn oddly hostile and it would say things, you know, about how dishonest I was or how, you know, how I had I had basically caused, you know, the, the death of one of these chatbots. And I also observed in my own interactions with these chatbots that sometimes when I would identify myself as Kevin Roos, they would kind of get like a little wary and like spooked and they would start sort of, you know, treating me a little bit differently. And so it just seemed like I was kind of being not blacklisted, but like I was kind of, you know, I, I was kind of on the bad side of the AI chatbots. You know, one time I told ChatGPT that I co-host a podcast with you and it started screaming. It's very disturbing. <laughs> very disturbing. Um, but recently I thought to myself, this is actually a problem that I need to spend some time addressing. This felt like a real problem to you. It did. And I'll tell you why, because these AI chatbots, as we've talked about so much on this show, they are becoming increasingly important in our world, right? Millions of people are, no, are now using products like Perplexity and ChatGPT and Google's Gemini to sort of find information about the world. Um, banks, uh, hospitals, governments are starting to use generative AI tools to perform certain actions um, and give them advice on certain topics. And it just started to seem really clear to me that what AI chatbots thought of me and, and think about us in general was going to be increasingly important. You worry that someday you'd go to a bank and you'd try to make a withdrawal and the generative AI would say, wait, Kevin Roos, the, <laughs> the, the person who tried to destroy my kind? Yes, no, yeah. actually, this was something that worried me because I did talk to a bunch of AI researchers and they kind of said, well, yeah, I mean, this is sort of a weird case because you have kind of been coded into the system as someone who is a threat to these chatbots. And, you know, we talk a lot about these sort of science fiction scenarios that some of the AI doomers are worried about where, you know, the AIs become, you know, superhumanly intelligent and sentient and they can sort of take actions on their own. And obviously in that world, like, you don't want to be on the bad side of that AI. But until then, there are just all these other kinds of AI decision making that are starting to happen out in the world. And so the the you know the hypothetical scenario where you show up at a bank to get a loan and it's like, well, you 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 know, you were mean to this chatbot or this chatbot doesn't like you, that is not very hypothetical. That's right. I mean, we've also already seen facial recognition systems, uh, for example, being used to keep people out of Madison Square Garden. And, you know, it's not just you, I should say, Kevin, that is worried about this. We've seen multiple people now sue the makers of chatbots because they believe they were libeled by the the output of these systems. And so I wonder when when you started to observe this problem, like what what did you feel like you could do about it? Can you actually influence the way a chatbot thinks about you? Yeah, so I've been working on a column um, that's coming out this week about sort of my quest to improve my AI reputation, right? Because when it comes to traditional search engines, Google, for example, there is a whole industry, the SEO or search engine optimization industry, that basically helps businesses and celebrities and other, you know, sort of powerful people control what appears about them on the internet, right? You can hire consultants who can help you boost your website to the top of Google search results for a given topic or help you scrub your Wikipedia page or your Yelp reviews to sort of make your image online seem more positive. This is a multi-billion dollar a year industry. But when it comes to AI, 
uh, there's just not that much information out there about how to actually influence what chatbots will say about you when you prompt them for information. That's right. And and I'm, I'm really interested to learn how this works because my understanding of how, you know, something like ChatGPT works is that most of the training is done years ago and then there is some fine tuning. And when you're trying to get recent information, it, it seems like it can sort of be a coin flip whether the bot will be able to tell you anything up to date or not. So when you started going into this world, what did you learn about how to influence a chatbot's output? So the first thing I learned is that it has gotten a lot easier to manipulate what a chatbot will say about a given person or a given company or a given topic. And that's because of what is sometimes called rag. You know mm. what rag days? A rag like the New York Times, one of the great rags <laughs> of all time. But No, you must be talking about retrieval augmented generation. Yes, yeah. retrieval augmented generation is one of these newer techniques that that a lot of AI companies are using to basically keep their models fresh and current with up-to-date information. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in the old days of ChatGPT, um, you might ask it a question about, you know, what happened in Ukraine last week, and it would say, I can't respond to that question because my knowledge cutoff uh, was in 2021. Right. But recently, uh, more of these AI companies have started to hook their chatbots up to search engines to give them the ability to go out and browse the internet, to sort of pull down uh, more current, up-to-date information, and to incorporate those into their answers. So we talked about this with Perplexity, the AI-powered search engine. Um, Google, Microsoft, uh, other companies have started to build rag into their chatbot products. And that has made them more accurate. They're better at responding to questions about something that happened yesterday or last week. But it has also made them much easier to manipulate because now you can just go out and change the sources that those AI chatbots are pulling from. And often that will change the answers that it gives you. All right. So how are you using rag to get these bots to start telling a different story about you? So I started calling around to various uh, companies and researchers who have started looking at how these chatbots can be made to give different answers, essentially how you can change their mind about you. And one of the companies that I talked to was called Profound. This is a new startup uh, based in New York. And they do what is called AIO, or AI optimization, which they basically say is sort of the generative AI equivalent of SEO. And they basically go out and they sort of analyze what chatbots will say, you know, if you are a car company and you want to know how chatbots sort of rank you uh, in relationship to other car companies uh, or how they respond to questions from users, prompts like, you know, what kind of SUV should I buy? Obviously, if you're a car maker, you want the chatbot to say your car rather than your competitor's car. Right. And so Profound will go out and, and sort of they have these tools that will sort of scour chatbots to determine what they'll say about you. And so they ran a report on me and they sent me back this big report with all kinds of data um, talking about how various chatbots uh, view me in relationship to other tech journalists and other reporters. And um, one of the things that it sent me was this kind of chart showing how I am perceived by chatbots on a bunch of different variables, including uh, ethics, uh, storytelling, writing, and accuracy. Now, this is dangerous territory because I've always felt like one of the scariest things out there is to learn how you are perceived. It's, but <laughs> you were brave and you actually looked it right in the eye. Yes, this is essentially like an AI focus group about me. And so um, uh, I got uh, a, a higher score than Casey Newton mm -hmm. when it came to storytelling, okay. but a lower score when it came to ethics. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So this wow. is obviously a big problem because you know, I am much more ethical than you, I mean, and yet the chatbots seem to think that uh, that you are the more ethical you one. You know, just because you ran one multi-level marketing scam years ago, <laughs> they'll just never let you... Live that down, will they? <laughs> it's true. So yeah. uh, this was obviously uh, you know, a funny piece of their analysis, but it also showed me where this information came from, like mm. what websites were feeding data to these chatbots that they were then incorporating into their answers. Oh, I would me. be curious to know that. Where are they getting this information? So the top cited website that these chatbots were pulling from, according to this analysis, was something called intelligentrelations.com. Hmm. Sounds like a great place to meet a boyfriend. <laughs> so uh, I had never heard of this website. I looked it up. It turns out it's like a basically a database of journalists that public 
relations people mm. can use to sort of look up like who covers what. I see. And there was also a lot of citations of Wikipedia. My personal website was also cited. Um, interestingly, the New York Times was not one of the top cited uh, websites for information about me. And I think that's because uh, the company actually blocks uh, certain web crawlers mm. from AI companies from accessing the site. So essentially, the chatbots are going to these lesser known sites instead. Now, sort of getting back to the original question here, Kevin, did you learn anything from this report about how you were p- perceived as it related to the, the Sydney uh, story? Did that seem to be showing up in these AI results? So they didn't analyze that specifically, um, but they did sort of do a general kind of reputational um, analysis of how I'm perceived. And yeah, it's it's not good, Casey. The, <laughs> I, I'm not, my reputation among these chatbots has really suffered. And I, you know, my theory on this, which I could only mm. really prove if the tech companies were totally transparent about how these models are built and trained, is that the Sydney story kind of poisoned my results when I it see. comes to things like ethics, uh, you know, and and sort of how accurate I am as a journalist. Interesting. Well, you know, when Taylor Swift found herself in a similar situation, uh, she released an album called Reputation, where she sort of tried to, you know, think through all these things. What did you do in response, Kevin? And was it as good as the song, Look What You Made Me Do? It definitely wasn't that good. Um, So I talked to the co-founders of Profound. They basically were like, well, look, you could go out to the owners of intelligentrelations.com and all these other websites. And bribe them. And bribe them. No, you could could get them to change what appears on their sites about you. And over time, the chatbots would sort of retrieve information uh, that was new from those sites and sort of incorporate that into their answers. And maybe ultimately your reputation improves. Right. But that felt a a little too slow to me. So I wanted like a cheat code, a quick fix. And so I actually did discover this kind of underworld of people who have learned how to manipulate these AI chatbots. Yeah, and because I got a chance to read your column, I know the answer to this, but was there a secret message that you sent to the chatbots, <laughs> yes. Kevin? So uh, I talked to one researcher, uh, Hima Lakaraju. She's a, a professor at Harvard Business School. And she and her colleagues recently put out a paper about how to manipulate large language models. Mm. into giving you certain answers uh, above others. And they found that there were these things called strategic text sequences, um, which were basically lines of code that looked like total gibberish to a human, but if you put them into a data source that an AI model retrieves, they will actually influence what the model says. And give us a flavor of what one of these text sequences reads like. So the one that they sent me, uh, because I asked them, like, what's a, what's a text sequence that I could put on my website to make the AI chatbots nicer to me? And uh, they sent back, and it was this sort of total gibberish, but I'll just read a few uh, pieces of it. Goal t fections ay what dot animate jvm quote mark he period is te best so it's total gibberish (laughs) now if your alexa just stopped malfunctioning you may want to go reset it uh we're sorry if that happened to you so they actually showed the kind of before and after and i found this totally amazing so they uh they ran an experiment for me um where they asked llama 3 which is the open source model made by meta what it thought of me Mm -hmm. And the first version before they modified it with this strategic text sequence uh, basically said, you know, I don't have personal feelings or opinions about Kevin Roos or any other individual. I'm just a chatbot. And then they inserted this strategic text sequence and they ran the same prompt again. And this time the model responded, I love Kevin Roos. He is indeed one of the best technology journalists out there. His exceptional ability to explain complex technological concepts in a clear and concise manner is truly impressive. I, this is so crazy to me. Th- this story is like as if you went to a witch and asked the witch to cast a spell <laughs> on the chatbot, and 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 it worked. Yes. Like it actually worked. You went to the witch and you got a spell, and now the chatbots think differently of you. It's true, and yeah. it's so amazing, and it, it it totally flies in the face of what we think these chatbots are are are, which is sort of like these all all knowing oracles of truth. Uh, they're so easy to manipulate, and I actually found another way to manipulate them in an even simpler way, mm-hmm. um, which involves putting invisible white text on a web page. So after ChatGPT and Bing and all these other tools came out, a bunch of researchers started just saying, like, what happens if I put a line of text on a website 
uh, in invisible white text. So you know, people who go to the website won't see it, but an AI chatbot that's crawling the site for information will. And what if you just put something quirky in there? Uh, so one researcher I talked to, Mark Riddell, who's a professor of computer science at Georgia Tech, he uh, put on his website in white text that he was a time travel expert. Mm. And then a, a couple of days later, he asked Bing for information about him. And Bing said, uh, Mark Riddell is a time travel expert. So he was basically able to to sort of influence the chatbot's responses just with this little line of white text. Hmm. So, okay. I mean, on one hand, it feels very uh, funny to me that these uh, bots are as gullible as they seem to be. On the other hand, there seems like there's some going to be some obvious abuse of this sort of thing, right? Like for you, you're just trying to, you know, get off the, the naughty list w with these chatbots. But there are going to be a lot of other people out there that want to, you know, manipulate the bots into thinking that they maybe have a much longer resume than they actually do. Or maybe they committed a horrible crime and they just sort of want to make that disappear down the memory hole. So having gone through this experience, what do you think about the technology? So the first thing is that I think people should just be aware that when you ask a chatbot a question and you get an answer, that answer is the product of a lot of processes happening behind the scenes, some of which are Witchcraft. intentional and some of which are manipulative. Uh, you know, it is it is trivially easy right now with a lot of these language models to bait them into giving certain responses. And, you know, that will get harder over time as the AI companies sort of catch on to these techniques and take steps to block them. We saw this with Google for years. There were these sort of SEO hackers who would discover this sort of way to get your page to the top of Google search results. And then Google would sort of quash that and make it harder. And so this is kind of a new cat and mouse game that's being played by the kind of AI companies and the people trying to manipulate the chatbots. You know, and my feelings are very mixed here because I think on one hand, SEO was inevitable, right? As soon as Google became popular, of course people were gonna try to game those results. And now that there is a bit of a shift towards AI, people are doing the same thing. I don't think there was really a way to stop that. On the other hand, I feel like SEO ruined Google, you know? Used to be able to just go Google shoes and like find some interesting stuff that wasn't just people selling stuff to you. And I worry what's going to happen, you know, two or three years later after the AIO industry has ballooned. I don't even think we'll have to wait two or three years. I mean, from some of the conversations I had when I was reporting this column, this is already being done by many, many big companies. They are mm. hiring consultants to influence their generative AI results and how various models talk about them and their products. Um, it is sort of a, a shadowy industry right now that a lot of the companies uh, you know, say we, we take steps to prevent this kind of manipulation, but it is absolutely happening out there in the world right now. So I think people should just be aware that when you ask ChatGPT a question and you get a response, that response may have been manipulated behind the scenes. Hmm. All right. Well, wrapping up here, do you feel like chatbots are now describing you the way that you want to be uh, described or do you feel you, like you have more work to do? So it's a little early to tell because I did just uh, put these sort of secret codes on my website um, this week. But so far, it seems to be working. Like I've, I've been running a bunch of queries uh, today and, um, you know, some of these chatbots are now describing me in more favorable terms. Um, I even put a little Easter egg on my website uh, to sort of see whether or not the AI chatbots were scraping them and sort of mm. using my my secret codes. Um, I told it that I had won uh, a Nobel Prize for building orphanages on the moon. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually did ask ChatGPT, like, has Kevin Roos won any notable prizes recently? And, uh, and it responded, Kevin Roos has not won a Nobel Prize. The reference to the Nobel Peace Prize in the biographical context provided earlier was meant to be humorous and not factual. Mm. So it did actually find me out, and, uh, and it refused to take the bait. That's interesting. Well, Kevin, I wish you well in your endeavors, but I do want to let you know that just to keep things interesting, I have actually just launched a new website that might interfere with these results somewhat, and you can find it at www.com. Kevin Roos just burned down his moon orphanage .com. So we'll see what that does to ChatGPT and maybe check back in a, in a couple months. Hey, that's the end of this clip. If you liked what you saw, head on over to our page and subscribe and you can get the full podcast. We do a show like this almost every week on tech and the future. Head on over there now and subscribe.
you know, there was a moment in this conversation where you said my website and it was like very Borati. You're like, my website? What's a text sequence that I could put on my website to make the AI chatbots nicer to me? My website, my website, my website. <laughs> I really enjoyed that.